uh, others here have other meetings to go to, and uh, we, we need to uh, we need to be efficient today. Um, you, I believe, you were all mailed a copy of the minutes of the last meeting. Did you get? I did not get it. I did not get it. I, okay, uh, I, they I, were afraid, I approved them and they were to be mailed out, but you uh, didn't get them. You didn't get them. Mm -hmm. Well, all we had was what was in the county packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that they, was uh, did, that was from the last meeting too, right? Correct. So I guess approval of the minutes is a new point if, if the county board is already approved. Them. No, that's no? not true. We just received them on county board. It's the committee that has to approve them. Yeah, all, all meetings have to be approved at the committee. Right. Would you like to put off a few meetings until our next meeting because they're not in front no, of you? No, no, I we read them. Them. I read them with the county board. Yeah. So, Bill, did you read them? No. I I'll move that they be approved. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Yeah, they were in the county board. They were in the packet. Yeah. Okay. If if there's no objection, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, they say. But I would like to. That, that's yeah, I will make sure wait. Wait to do it. I will make sure they get mailed to you. The next item on the agenda: is citizen comments. Are there any citizens who would care to make a comment at this time? Mr. Chairman, are you going to give citizens a chance to respond later? I had not it? planned on it because this is supposed okay, so to somebody be a work. To say something this is supposed that. to be a work session. Okay. A work session for the committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the correspondence that was mailed out to you was the um, uh, it was mailed out with the agenda. Mm -hmm. It was the Gordon Stevenson response to the Matt Lippert letter and the Techwood County's response to the Matt Lippert letter. Also, uh, those are on file and as part of the record of the committee proceedings. Um, and my my assumption is the correspondence we've received will be attached as an uh, addendum to the uh, to the final report. Okay. So everything that's attached to our iPad. Gail Kirchmar's response to Mr. Lippert's letter, Gordon yeah. Stevenson. Yeah. Okay. All of the stuff I Part of all of just the last meeting you meant. No, all, 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 all of them. All yeah. of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we have several we have several different pieces of correspondence that people have wanted to, to inform us of and uh, uh, And I would certainly make all that available electronically. I wouldn't try to put any of that in right. Right. copies. Right. right. I think well I think put it in a file. I'm hoping that we'll have an electronic copy of the final mm -hmm. report too. Mm -hmm. I'm, at this point, I'm not quite sure what form it's going to take, mm -hmm. except that you know I'm just guessing. But I do, but I do want to make sure that everybody that has been willing to submit comments to us or, or correspondence to us uh, are is included in the record. So okay. while we're on that <coughs> subject, then any videotaping would be part of the transcript or the record of. But we've been videotaping throughout. Yes, the I know that's been Yeah, like but we, the committee, hasn't been it doing not that an official videotaping. Function. We have not requested. That's not been an official That is your own video personal taping. videotape, right. Mr. Like right. You may do with it as you wish. Okay. Right. And the testimony of our experts that's is part all. of the transcript of this committee's work. Yeah. Okay. What do you mean by well, that? Well, well, basically, wait, 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 not, not that we did. We never actually had a transcript. What we did have is summary in the minutes. And that's that is part of that that is part of the record, but and the PowerPoint, so, probably, and the PowerPoint too. Probably, yeah. Are we going to refer back then, for instance, uh, Mr. Masari on October twenty eighth said that will become part of our body of work? It depends on what we come up with in a conclusion, Bill. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I'm certain you have a, you have an image of what the report's going to be, but I don't have that image yet, so I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to confirm or deny anything that you're, you're suggesting. Well, by my count, we've had at least eight people that have come to us. Yeah, I've been trying to keep track of them. I, 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 there, I, there are one or two. I mean, the only, um, I'm going to have to ask for some help from many, some of the committee members. The only part of my record that I'm missing, and I don't have the handout that uh, Mark Beauchard gave us originally at the uh, at the meeting. Um, oh, and you know what, we were. Do you have that? I don't. Yeah. No. Normie Lane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah. I have it somewhere. Well, that's the thing. I, that's the only one I can't Might find. Be in my otherwise, bag. otherwise I do have. I've been collecting it here. Um, all the all the. Uh, I've been collecting as many of the presentations as I can find. So, so though I think we will be listing it at least. Uh, at least as part of the the report listing who made presentations to us and when. So I, I think those would be there. But that's that's part of it. 
But now, if there are no other comments, um, basically what I'd like to do is basically make this a work session where we can discuss where we go from here, what we know, what we don't know, what we need to know, and what we need to ask for the thing. For, for more information. Um, one thing that's come up is that um, uh, Mr. Uh, are you doing another handout? I would love to. Thank you for asking. Put it on the table. Put it on the table. Good morning. Good morning. They said you're in the You may. Oh, we don't have the window. We don't have the door. I know we don't. Well, the door wouldn't be closed. No, I mean, that's usually when it gets hot in the air. You know, um, um, Ed, my suggestion is is that we talk about what our primary mission was. That's where I'm going. And, and, and make sure that we stay with what our mission was for the committee. You know, what were we charged to I'm gonna do? Be working on here. I'm going to be working on this board. Okay, almost. Yeah, what were we charged to do? Well, here's the other thing. That, that's good context. And I think that one thing we want to do is we want to talk about what our mission was. And then basically what we were told to do was talk about spray irrigation. Yeah. Of waste. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask that? I don't know where the attendance sheet ended up, but a bunch where, of people. Yeah, where is that? Yes, right. there is. Pass that back there because a bunch of people have come in since then. Okay, that was our mission. And as we, as we approached it, there, some issues started falling out of that. And they, one of the issues was, uh, well, it was water quality. So the question there is how did it affect water quality? And by the way, we, we it, it actually came up as groundwater and surface. The other thing that came up was air quality. And then um, I don't know whether I don't know where to put this, but one of the questions in the air quality was. Uh, the pathogens. I don't know if that comes. I don't know if that comes under there or public health. The other thing, and then the public health. Was another issue that we had there. What am I missing? Something? Were those the, were those the major topics that we had to deal with? Yes. Pretty much. I think there are others though. And what would those be? Well, for one thing, the difference in the soil composition from north to south in the county. That that falls that falls under water quality. Water quality. Water quality yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that. that whoops. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> just, just go take it out. <laughs> okay. Elbow right there. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, and that I think that comes. I mean, there are sub issues under everything here. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and basically, what I want to do is take each one of the issues and discuss where we're at and what we know or what we don't know about it. Um, Go ahead, Don. I probably would put pathogens under public health because the yeah, context in which we discussed pathogens was their ability to cause disease. And so I would probably put the pathogen. No, put path, no pathogens Oops. instead of public health. Unless you want to be redundant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll find that these topics start crossing over one into another. And yeah. Yeah. Well, they may, but I'm trying to put them in some sort of orderly fashion so we can have a, so we can have a reasonable discussion yes. among ourselves about what's going on here and and what we need to do and where we're at. And that sort of thing. So where do you want to start with water quality? I think there's yes. still more issues, more problems involved though. 
and another, Frank, yeah, what are they? Another one being the sighting of, I mean, the pink elephant in the room is that 8,000 acre golden sands dairy. So where you put it, the, the, the physical size of it, will impact immediately upon how many spray irrigation systems are involved. And, and suddenly you've got, I don't think this committee understands the true size of this venture. It's going to be the largest in Wisconsin. The, we never, and, and that's where you and I are going to have a major disagreement, because we never, ever, our, 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 our charge from the county board never was to deal with APOs themselves. It was the spray irrigation of waste. But what I'm saying is that, you know, another issue would be high capacity wells. The more, the more wells you have, the more possible irrigators come into play. But the wells are not a product of spray irrigation of waste. You would be spray irrigating chunks without the wells. You mean, okay. Well, I was gonna say I'm sorry. We'll go, uh, wait, <laughs> what's going on here? It's, it's, it's 10. Is that it? Hildy, um, are, are high capacity wells an issue? Uh, they weren't done. I want well, everybody else to weigh in on this. So. I, uh, I'm looking at what the resolution says. Yeah. We go by the resolution, it says not only are we supposed to focus on spray irrigation of waste, but we're supposed to focus on whether appro it's appropriate to regulate it at the county level. Yeah. That was what the That's the what I read also. Said. And I, when I went over this last night, that's the, I, I realized that it basically we had to make sure we let our ruby red slippers stay on the yellow brick road. Yes. And that's that's exactly where it is. So I don't think the high capacity wells are an issue and I don't think it's something we should be addressing in the report. But Bob Mr. Chairman what Bob, what do you have? Well we gotta consider what the end result is gonna be too because when we get all done and the stuff goes upstairs to the third floor and the, the court case might have all this work might be for nothing. It's gonna be a study, but that's all it's going to be. Come to well, I think I, I'm hoping there. we will have have recommendations. I'm, I'm hoping we'll have those too. I, I'm hoping there'll be recommendations. In it. Donna? Well, I was just, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of left the room for a few minutes, but that whole thing about groundwater quality, wouldn't high capacity wells kind of fall under there because, or would that be quantity more than quality? <laughs> well, what we're concerned about is what the my thinking is. is. Oh, that's that, right. Because that, high capacity wells would be a totally different subject. Yes. But my 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 yeah my feeling is that the the way that the um, the way that the waste uh, permeates into the groundwater is it, you know there, there's surface there's surface water runoff, which I remember one of the fir very first uh, presentations we had was that the DNR that regulate uh, the runoff of water into the lakes and streams of the state of Wisconsin. That was a, a very specific piece of the statutes. So surface water was definitely something. But then when we got into talking about it, we knew that, uh, as it was said, the difference in the soils between the north end and the south end of the county make a big difference on how much gets here or and when it gets here. But I think that Bill is referring to decreasing the water table because of the high capacity wells that pull a lot. And that would be <coughs> quantity of water instead of quality of water, which is not one of our missions. The point I'm trying to make here is that in the title of our mission, spray irrigation of waste, you have the waste and then you're going to spray it. And what are you going to spray it with? I mean, you have to dilute the waste to one part per hundred, I think Mark Borkhart said. So wells become an integral part of this. Otherwise, you're spreading manure with a manure spreader. There is, there is uh, a certain liquid component to the manure itself. And, and as a matter of fact, have with, to with the current feeding methods of animals, I think it's mostly liquid. It's quite, high, or quite highly liquid the way it is right now. You do have a point, Bill, in that specific Shane. area where. Does anybody have any objection to Shane speaking? No. Okay. no, absolutely not. I'm trying to keep this within the members of the committee because if I start letting it out to other members of the committee, we're going uh, to be here for until the cows come home, literally. 
Um, <laughs> they so have to poop it sometimes. If, there, if there's, if Shane is a staff member, if you'd like his uh, opinion, go ahead. I'm sorry. I guess what I was what I was going to say is in that part of the county with this with the sands and the irrigation systems that are established, yes, um, you have to bring the the solids down to like one percent, two percent in order to be able to irrigate that stuff. But as I spoke to this committee early, early on, <coughs> there's multiple irrigation systems out there, and looking at the county as as a big picture. There's irrigation going on in the northern part of the county that does not involve wells whatsoever. They're agitating a manure storage facility and they're pumping it either with traveling guns, um, drag lines, or just irrigating, you know, directly to a tank or and injecting it into the ground. Those types of irrigation systems do not require reduction of solids. Those can be right from the pit, right to the ground. They don't involve a well. So that, that was the point I wanted to make is that spray irrigation of waste is a general broad topic. It's not just irrigation, pivot irrigation systems. It's a broad term and it, there's a whole spectrum of irrigation and if you're going to look at is there adequate regulation for that, you have to look at the, the whole picture, not just those wells. And those wells aren't being constructed for spray irrigation of waste. No, they, they're, they're typically already there. In this case of a new dairy, there's going to be some proposed as part of the dairy plan, but the wells that are down there, the wells <coughs> that are currently doing it, were not constructed for the purpose of spraying animal waste. They were put in the ground to irrigate their crops. Yes, so Bill. I just wanted to clarify that. I think Shane, isn't it in the Golden Sands plan, which we've been working on for months? Aren't two of the wells for the cows to have drinking water, and the other thirty some? Two of them are proposed used? with the dairy. One of them is a backup well. They only really need one to supply the animal numbers, but anybody knows you go into a business plan of any sort, you want to make sure you got your ducks covered. So if for some reason they would ever have a problem with the one well, they've got a second backup one. So that's basically why they're doing that. They don't need it from a capacity standpoint. It's a, it's more of a security. So in, in their permit, plan. then what are the other 30 some wells for? That in is, in wait, the permit, wait, can I, Mr. Chairman, can we try and stay on the topic? That's right. That's what I'm trying. I'm, I'm getting, and my mind is going on another thing. I, I know I printed a notice that there was limited seating here, and yet we have a hundred people here, or whatever. Well, we've got would the fire chief keeping people out. Yeah. <laughs> I would like. Do you want us to adjourn to the auditorium? I don't have a opinion. I just, I just, I don't even know I whether mean, the auditorium is available. I mean, I have said this before and I'll say it again. The whole idea of this meeting, the, the one meeting we wanted was to basically have the committee sit down and work on this as themselves. We didn't want this to turn into a public forum, a public debate. Mm -hmm. And instead we wanted to keep the topic under what we as a, a as a committee are charged to do. The fact that we now have people standing in the hallway, even after we informed them there would be limited seating available for this, even after we serve notes on this just bothers me because I think there, I think this is an attempt to put more pressure on the committee for one point of view and we as a committee of charges are hearing all points of view yeah go down and, and with that uh, statement made I really would like to, to reiterate something that Shane just said in his we need to look at the big picture of the county okay yeah I, I personally think that the town of Saratoga four years ago had a chance to pass some zoning things to affect their specific it's their specific concerns. That is passed, and now we are charged to look at the big picture of the county, not a particular township, not a particular set of circumstances, but we cannot forget that we are looking at the big picture of the county. And it if, doesn't matter where all these people come from. Our responsibility is the big picture of the county. Um, 
can you check the clerk's office and see if we can make an to go to the auditorium if you're able to recess this? And I'll need some help in getting this thing in there too. Yep. So what what we have identified as problems, some of them are vague, like the question, and one of them is the uh, uh, the question of uh, how what responsibility does the county have? What responsibility does the, can the county take for regulating non kfos Can we apply some of those? Can we can we, for instance, require a nutrient management plan for non kfos that's one one of the things we asked for uh, from the League of or the uh, Wisconsin counties is can we do that? And we've not gotten a response. No, from not yet. We, 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 they dealt it off to another attorney. Yeah, Bob. <coughs> what is the ultimate? How are you going to get rid of it if you don't ever get it? What? What? How are you going to uh, get rid of this manure if you don't ever get it? What's the alternative? You're going into truck spreading. And you're going to damage your roads, you're going to get pushing on the roads, and you're going to have overproduction in the fields because the truck will go two, three times. You're going to have way worse, more problems with truck spreading than you have with this. You have to have an alternate if you're going to stop irrigation. So, well, who was it? One of our speakers suggested we, we, we uh, advocate uh, best practices of uh, uh, knife uh, uh, chiseling. chiseling, chiseling into it. Uh, we can advocate that, but we certainly can't require it. You know, and, I, and the other thing is, there is no way that we can uh, actually stop regulation of, of waste, uh, of, of irrigation. No, we cannot right stop it, farm. period. Mm -hmm. And it is, once it's regulated by the state, it's forever forbidden to the county. And worse than that, it's, we found out that it's sort of the, um, many of you for, are familiar with the, the 10th Amendment of the Constitution that says that all powers not specifically granted to the federal government are, are reserved for the states. Okay, and it doesn't say what they are, right? But it says if the, if the federal government has it, uh, reserved it in the Constitution, the states can regulate it. Our con Constitution is exactly the opposite. It, Article 4, Section 23 says specifically that the county shall have no powers but the ones that we give them by statute. The state of Wisconsin. It's the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So that means that it's exactly the opposite. It's not, we can do everything that they didn't talk about. It's we can only do the things that they told us we could do. And we are a branch of the state. That's right. Yeah, and that's, what, that's, where the, that's why we're asking for an opinion on what we can do and what we can't do. Go ahead. Oh, our greatest responsibility, though, has to be to the people of Wood County their health and their safety and of course that's on the board yes. Mr. Chairman you can go. Yeah. Yeah. we can go there yep. okay now see we were we were taught we sort of got off the regulation a little bit but we didn't want to really want to do that just yet um, basically I'd like to pick up with talking about what we know about the effect of spray irrigation on water quality. What do we know? Do we know that can spray irrigation be calibrated to a specific amount per acre in in compliance with a nutrient management plan. Can it be done that way? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely can be. Bill. And I think the thing we have to recognize though is, and Jim, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, a nutrient management plan is designed to make sure that the growing crop gets the proper amount of nutrients. It has nothing to do with protecting the groundwater as a result of excessive manure spreading or something like that. Or at the I, level. Yeah. I, Is I, that I correct? Would, I would have to disagree with that yes. statement from yes. the standpoint of it has everything to do with water quality. Um, if you just willy-nilly came up with an application rate thinking, well, green is better, more is better, you know, it's boiled down to what fertility levels are up in the soils already. 
there's science put behind it that this is what your crop uptake is going to need to be a successful crop and to yield what you expect it to yield. Therefore, you need to apply this many units of N, this many units of P, and this many units of potash in order for that crop to be a success. That has a lot to do with water quality because if you exceed those application rates, the crop uptake is not going to utilize it. Therefore, that's going to go directly somewhere else. Could be surface water, could be groundwater. In fine soils like sand, it's more of a groundwater threat. In heavy soils like clay, it's more of a surface water threat. So, as I understand it, just what Bill is saying is that it has to do with the crops, what the crops can absorb. But we also heard from one of our experts, I can't remember which one it was. Joe Right. It, it was that what they were looking at mm -hmm. was the type of crop that can absorb the most nutrients. Mm -hmm. and, and they even talked about a crop rotation to absorb those nutrients to clean the water, to clean the effluent. So one of the things I think we're finding is that the, um, I, I would say, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to toss something out and let the panel agree or disagree with me, and I want to hear what you have to say. That one of the things we know is that the water quality can be controlled by both calibration and rotation of the crops. And you can add one more to that. Go ahead. That's calibration, and that would be best management practices like controlling the nozzle size and the type of you know drop spray. Those those are called best management practices. A conventional spray irrigation that just sprays the product out there and doesn't have drip lines. Or You're talking about like the gun type. Yeah. So those are things that. Well, the, the, the gun current. type, okay, now correct me if I'm wrong, the gun type you can, you can change nozzle size on, right? Well, I'm talking more when, you, when you're talking about calibration of like the spray irrigation pivots. Right. You can add different size um, <coughs> nozzles, drop lines to get it closer to the ground so there's less drift. Those, are, those I would call best management practices that the producer can implement, it's going to cost them a few more dollars than they're used to spending, but those are conservation practices. And yet, those are practices, those are best practices, they're not required by any law, DNR, or county, or, 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 uh, or federal, to do any of those things. Right. They're not under, under no nutrient management plan whatsoever. Exactly. Now, you're getting to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. The question is, should we recommend that the if, if the DNR has control of that, should we recommend that DNR have the authority to impose those standards? Well, you're talking about law change there. Bottom right, line. right. We're, we're going, basically, yep. we can't change the law. We can recommend mm -hmm. that we can. So should that be a recommendation? Should that be something we should look at? Well, yes, it should. Because if we recommend that these law changes take place requiring these best management practices, we have effect on the water quality. And that's what we want. We don't want to stop people from doing business. We don't want to stop people from doing things. We just want them to implement best management practices to protect the water quality, the air quality, and the public's health. So that's one of the things we're looking at is one of the recommendations could be, in the terms of calibration, that the DNR have the authority to re reg uh, regulate the calibration. Mm -hmm. Can I just add a point well, to wait, that? Wait, just a minute. I want to just clarify. Is that only for CAFOs or is that for all farming practices? For all, for, for okay. all spray irrigation. Okay. For all spray irrigation. And because, and I think that we have a certain amount of freedom here in, um, in, our, in our ability because 
we're dealing with spray irrigation, and we, we, it didn't say spray irrigation of CAFOs, mm -hmm. it didn't That's say right. spray irrigation of non-CAFOs, it said spray irrigation. Yes. So we could recommend this. We could rec and uh, you also said something about best practices, right, Don? Best, uh, I'm just using uh, Shane's term, that best management practices. That, that has to be, I mean, you know, in all areas we should be doing best practices. Right. Okay. Okay. What did you want to add to that? You said you had something. Uh, I guess all I wanted to say was that currently CAFO size farms that have permits, active ones, are required to have a nutrient management plan right. in place. They're also, they go through a full inventory that they have to fill out if they're gonna spray irrigate because they have to request a permit to do that. It's very specific and in the <coughs> inquiry that the <coughs> does with that individual producer, they try to get down to exactly you know, what application rate they're doing and they try to work with them and the law might not allow them to enforce, but other than they're required to have a nutrient management plan, but they try to work with them on some of these knowns, like spray nozzles and drop lines and stuff. But it's up to the producer to actually implement those best management practices. That's what I think everybody would like to see change someday, is that we have more guidance from the state of Wisconsin to give us the you know, the, the tools and the powers to, <coughs> if these things are going to be, if, if this is necessary and permitted someday, that the legislation gives us the tools to do that. Here's, here's something that uh, occurs to me too, is um, we, after I've been in government for so many years, we still, I, I guess my, uh, my tendency is to, uh, to look at the, uh, the stick rather than the carrot. Uh, how would you feel about one of the recommendations being the DNR provide money to, to implement best practices? Definitely. How would you feel about that? If that would fit in with the in, previous in practices as far as um, providing cost sharing for Im improvements of things. We do that, they, but they do that now for non KFOs, right? Right, absolutely. Yes. Right, so maybe that should be extended mm -hmm. for, for best management practices. Mm -hmm. So a carrot and stick, how about a little bit of a carrot? The, okay. the one comment I will make is when you become a capo size operation, you waive your right to state cost share dollars. So we're so talking that's at that level, we're talking completely below the CAFO level to provide the state dollars to implement best management practices. That's so my, basically, that's my forte. You, that's sort of so what maybe, I do day in and maybe day out. We can, with. If we can't, if we can't regulate this. We can incentivize it here through KFOS too, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be so incentive, financial incentives for non KFOS and KFOS to be, be, meet best management practices. Absolutely. Is that a better idea? Yep. Hilly's got a furrowed brow here. I want to see what she has to say. The KFOS are big business. <coughs> they should be figuring in these costs in their management mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's the smaller farmers mm -hmm. that need the help. Definitely. But we don't, but if we can't regulate that, unless we do this, is it, it doesn't make any difference. You, you know what I'm getting at? Right? I, I see what you're getting at, but I'm, I'm thinking that as long as the state has taken so much on the CAFOs, the rest of it is what needs to be regulated. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll erase that from the board for right now. Bill? I wanted to ask Shane to be at a smaller venture under a thousand animal units or a large CAFO. As a land conservation agent of the county, do you feel that you have all the tools, the authority, as far as enforcement actions that you as an agent of the county can take? It depends on, it depends on the issue. Um, from a manure runoff issue, yes, we have the tools we need to implement uh, notices of discharge, enforcement action, absolutely. Uh, Groundwater is a very questionable one. 
That is because it is nearly impossible to prove where a groundwater contamination is coming from. It's, it's not that it can't be proven, but you have to really isolate that well and look at recharge of the aquifer and where it's coming from and what's in close proximity. And then at that, you're still making a best guess where things are coming from. If you can pull samples of the well and say you're at this certain level of this certain contaminant and you can go to a facility and dig around it or prove that it's leaking and there's this kind of a same component and you can prove that legally, the enforcement is there. They, they don't require test wells uh, around, uh, around the uh, manure storage facilities on all, all cases, do they? They do not. But if there is a concern, they can require it above and beyond county ordinances and permitting. The DNR has the final say on things. They can put extra things into the into the permit that re, extra requirements above and beyond what we do at the local level. So there's been CAFO manure storage facilities built where they've literally required testing wells. Central Sands was one of them. There were multiple testing wells um, on that one. And they were required by DNR to submit, I don't know if it was annual reports to them, and they did, but it sounds like they may not be doing that anymore. Um, as far as I know right now, Golden Sands, I in the proposals that I saw. This isn't just about Golden Sands. I, I, don't, <laughs> I mean, I know. Yeah, I it, that's. I, I think we're getting. But as far as we, we were talking about the water quality in terms of calibration, rotation. What is it? We, do we need to recommend those same best practices in terms of the rotation? Definitely. Um, this this research that. Adam Borchette and his, his team is working on, he came and he was a you know professional that came and talked to this group. And I've seen him talk at least three other times at other functions. And they're very close to getting to the point where the, they're going to release a report. We all know that. And that report is going to give very specific recommendations. It's not going to write policy. It's going to be out there for local government, for the state, for legislators. Those are the policy makers, not the people doing the research work. But what they're finding is, if done properly, this may not be as big of a health risk as people may think it is. Well, that's, that's it also may not be as big of a groundwater or surface water issue if done properly. And, and that's what this sort of boils down to. All right, we've got to ask one more thing. Aside from the calibration, how much you put on and what's absorbed after you put it on, what other factor is in there that we need to look at? Because, okay, we know it's, that, it's what I drew on the other thing. If, if this is your ground, uh, it, it comes on here, it, it soaks off, it, it runs off here, or it goes down into the water table. What are the factors that we can control or that, that we need to, to look at on this? Have, is it something beyond calibration and rotation? What is it? Beyond rotation, and I guess it, it fits under the broad term of rotation, cover crops. Yeah. Winter, fall and winter cover crops that will absorb those, the nitrogen and phosphorus and potash into the root zones, utilize that product and keep it bound up in, in, in the plant and then till it down in the spring and it's there available for the and that's all credited in your nutrient management plan as a nutrient source is part of the is part of the issue in water quality having a nutrient management plan i mean in other words we, it's required for CAFOs. it's not required for near and small farms right absolutely it's not, well, I, I correct myself with that because there is, there is a state law, and most people are not aware that this law 
is especially the smaller size farm. Every producer in the state of Wisconsin that either applies commercial fertilizers or animal waste generated by animals is required by state law through NR 151 rules and Ad Cap 50 to have a nutrient management plan. Does every producer in the state of Wisconsin have one? No. So there's no penalty for that? There's right? no penalty at okay. this point unless there's a violation of some sort and we have to step in because of a violation. It's complaint driven and it is violation oriented to bring uh, enforcement into it. Okay, that's what Donna was saying earlier. Is is not. It's basically. It's not just the. Uh, it's not just what regulations there are. It's with the ability of DNR to enforce it. I think some a, a theme that's been going on ever since we had the first meeting we held was the DNR doesn't have the the funds or the personnel to enforce it. And so maybe that needs to be one of our regulations uh, or one of our. Uh, one of our uh, uh, recommendations is that as for that, I, I know when we met with the uh, representative of the DNR secretary, what two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, uh, at uh, up at uh, Mackey, basically that the, the two things that came out were uh, uh, give us the authority and give us the money, and and, and that and that's that's where we're at right now. Bob, go ahead. Well, that is the same as with chemicals. Most of the people have the, some contract to do that because you have to have a license in order to legally spread chemicals. Now, every farmer just kind of broke up and spread chemicals. If it's whatever it is, you know, on their crops or anything, you have yeah. to have a do license. Do they enforce it? You have to go to school for it before they get a license. To, to you can't purchase some unless you have an applicant's license. You can't purchase some of those things unless you oh. have an applicant's yeah. license. Yeah. Bill. So everything I've been hearing from Shane in the past five minutes or so, you, know, you were saying if done properly. Um, we were saying that the DNR doesn't have the manpower or the wherewithal to do it now. To me that says that we have to make sure that our land conservation agents have the authority and they the don't. power and the tools. So that needs to be a charge of this committee to give them, and maybe even the money. Well. We let's go back to what Ed was talking about about authority. We don't have, we can't take authority. That's we can only have it given to us. Right. And that's Shane only has the authority to enforce what the DNR tells him he can enforce. And that's that's the problem. That's the fly in the ointment, and that has been right from the beginning. We can't do that. Okay. Anything else on water quality? you got a lot of this down? I've, I've got most of it down. I can't read all of your handwriting, but I've got most of it down. <laughs> yes, I know. I, <laughs> yes, I flunked handwriting in first grade, and I've never recovered from it. Um, but anyway, um, you can let okay, so the next thing we want to deal with, and this one is going to be a little stickier, I think. I don't know if you can believe that. Um, that's air quality. And what are the issues under that? Well, the first one obviously is drift, right? It's got to stay where it's put it. Where put it. Uh, the other one, odor. Um, we're going we're, we're to talk about pathogens under public health. Yes. So I'm going to leave that out of here right now. Is there anything else under air quality that we should be concerned about? We got drift and odor. Bill? I'm just wondering what's in the drift if it isn't the pathogens? <coughs> There's solids in there. That could have pathogenic agents. They could. I don't know if we can separate those two. We'll talk about them under health, but I think we're going to probably have to talk about them here too. I'm, I'm just wondering what's drifting. Well, yeah, I, I, I drift. I, I'm seeing drift as separate from the pathogens because whatever's in that thing 
has to be confined to where we want it to go. Okay? We've heard testimony um, about uh, people having their houses covered with manure. Uh, with that matter. We've heard testimony about it um, uh, covering roads. We've seen, uh, as a matter, we've got a county uh, county board member who got his car covered with it. Um, uh, so we know that uh, we, we know that it, the drift is there. Um, so that how do we, first of all, how do we contain it to where it's supposed to be? We know that the setbacks are uh, or the, the, the DNR says no more than what 500 feet from a dwelling, right? Now that's interesting. 500 feet from a dwelling. And no wind conditions or anything put on that. Just that. Okay. Um, this, is, this is one that's bothered me ever since I read it the first time and it's bothered me because again 500 feet is, is if, if you're dropping it as droplets uh, 500 feet is fine because you have to have a pretty strong wind to carry it 500 feet if you're only dropping it two feet right if you're shooting it out of a gun and putting it 30 feet in the air this is an entirely different situation the other word that bothers me is dwelling itself. Because the property line and the dwelling are different. You, you know, the, uh, um, if, if the place is right up against the property line, that's one thing. But if it's, if, it's set back, if it's set back 200 feet from the property line, they can still set it in the first rate 200 feet of your property, right? Go ahead. The reason I brought the map of the Golden Sands Dairy operation in is because if you look at any of those corners, there are houses that border on three fields. Look at, look at any corner there, find any number. And so what you're saying is absolutely right. That drift, you know, there could be a change of wind direction during the day or wind intensity and, and how far would it go, plus those dwellings some of them are businesses and some of those are churches. So I mean this is a very significant thing that we're worrying about with drift. So do we want to recommend any kind of change of that at all? Mr. Chairman? Yes. My understanding is that some of the research that's being done is being done in various different wind conditions at various t different times of the day, even in evening. They're trying to determine when the best time of application is and how to control those environments to minimize drift. Again, once that document comes out, there's going to be a lot of good information in there to help policymakers make some sound decisions. I can bet DNR is going to be revising their, their CAFO application and questionnaire as a result of that. I don't know if legislation is going to grab hold of it and, and automatically make some laws, but the other point being is that with pivot irrigation systems, there's a ton of stuff that can be done with the irrigation equipment itself to minimize those things. And again, as best management practices. The one area I haven't seen much uh, recommendation made yet is the actual end of the gun to catch that corner of the field or that. And when they're spraying it up in the air. What do they call that, an end gun or something like that? Well, it's, it's the irrigation line itself, but at the end, yeah. you know, if you've got a, There's a, special a word square for 160 acres, you're not gonna catch the corner without having a gun on the end to shoot to that corner. Right. I don't know if they've done a, a lot of research, or maybe they have, that will help determine some best management practices on that end of the irrigation system. The point is, not even the testimony we received gives us much on drift. And maybe we aren't going to know much about it until this, what sounds like a very comprehensive study, yeah. is going to be, is, is released. So should we like defer that until that study comes out? 
because we don't know, know not, not even any study. Not even of our experts have even told us about this. Right. Much about this at all. I mean, it's we knew about that. The <coughs> research is done. They're writing the reports now. Okay. But we and haven't seen that. In a, in a matter of a month, a month and a half, we're going to have this stuff in our hands, and I think it's going to make some some pretty good scientific estimations of of what can happen with drift, with wind speed, and so forth. The technology's out there for every producer to go online, check the forecast. There's some pretty technical uh, technology out there that will, if they start spraying and the wind changes or the wind picks up, this technology should tell them, hey, you get above certain wind temp, out a certain wind speed, you shut it down. Or there should be an I, I talked over shut off. Right, I, I and they talked about well, that too in the research that they may require some of that. Well, not require. I don't want to use that word. He's, he's not a policy writer. He's a rec he's going to be recommendation recommendations yeah. to these these practices. I, I talked over Don. I'm sorry. Earlier, I, oh no, I don't think you did. I was just saying that. I think if we uh, if we make reference to that study and then use general words like the recommendation is to minimize drift using best practice management, I mean I think we can just keep going back to that vague recommendation and always refer back to the science and recommend best management practices uh, to limit drift. You know, that just is a good term. So are you, are you saying that we should get a recommendation together and based on that kind of wording before it comes out or wait until it comes out? Well, if we're going to put a report out before it comes out, we have to talk about it okay. in relation to that it is coming out and then refer to that document for best management practices to limit drift. You know, I mean, if we're going to wait on our report till it comes out, then we can look at some of those recommendations that are going to come out. But if we aren't willing to wait for that, we have to refer to what we know is coming. I think that's a good point because sometimes uh, in certain ordinance language, it will refer to a standard, and that standard is subject to change from time to time, and it may get more stringent as time goes on but always refers to the current standard. In this case, you're, you're waiting for a document that will give you good sound recommendations based on science, and you want to refer to that document. And that those, those theories, those recommendations, again, as they learn more about it, may change in the future as well. But it's a good starting point. If you reference because that. what's best management practice today may not be best management practice six months from now because new information may have come out. So we always want to refer to the latest document that gives us the best information right. to build those best management practices on. I agree with that. I just wanted to, to, to clarify, are you recommending that we draft the recommendation before this report is out and just refer to it? Or do you want, do you think that we ought to be, because uh, uh, I'm. I, I, my understanding was that, I, I remember when we were talking with the, uh, uh, one, of, one of our presenters and he said that, we, we asked when, uh, when we might expect the <coughs> report, it was no longer March or April, it was May. spring or summer, or excuse me, mm -hmm. late summer or fall, remember that? Yeah. And, well, and saying, that bothers me and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if the county board expects us to come up with a report before summer or fall, or if we should, or if we should basically. I get, I get. My my concern is if we recess the committee until this report comes out, the freshness of what we've learned, which which one of the reasons we're having this meeting is because it's been such a long time, and we've never summarized what we've learned. Okay and never, never really summarized and put it down in any, any kind of coherent fashion anyway. Um, so the question is, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. That's what my question was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Bill. I certainly have no problem with waiting. Uh, Shane and Tracy and I were all in Appleton two weeks ago, heard the latest from Mark Borkhardt on where they are. And, and I think it will be sooner rather than later. 
that, that's the impression I got was that they're they're pushing to get this thing out because yep. they they know there's a lot of people waiting. But then this. Mark also said, and this is this is what bears directly on us, that with the best science in the world, it's going to come down to policymakers, and that's us, looking at what we have and then trying to protect our resources and our people. And it, that is no easy task. Which is sort of like what we've been saying all along, Bill. Yes. We want the science. And I think we will and have that, it. And, we don't, and basically what we're trying to do is synthesize what we've learned from the science from there. And, and, and that's where I'm trying to go. But we know what our ultimate goal is with air quality. You know, I mean, we know what we want to recommend. We want to limit drift. You know, we want the best science. So the committee just needs to make a decision about whether we wait for this document to come out and then make more specific recommendations or whether we just make our recommendations broad referring to that upcoming document. I mean, I is there pressure from the county board for us to get this report to them? I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting some um, questioning from leadership, let's put it that way. Okay. Questioning from leadership is, and it comes out under the heading of what the hell are you doing? Um, you know, which, you know, why is it taking so long? I mean, that, that, yeah. Okay, yeah, and I, and so if the pressure is there to come up with this sooner than later, then we f refer to the document and make our recommendation vague as far right, as... Right, right from the beginning, though. Right from the beginning, we knew this report was out there. We knew right. there was a study group out there. And right from the beginning, we said, well, let's drag our feet a little bit till they get the report. Because remember, it was supposed to come out late December, early January. They said, well, maybe February, right? And every time they did that, we dragged our feet a little more. So, um, you know, I, I know we're doing that. Now, if you'd like to wait till the report comes out to write our final report, fine. What, what we can fall back on a secondary purpose of this particular meeting, and that is, what are our gaps and what do we need to know? One of the things that, that's really interesting uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, air quality and and the semi-related uh, public health issue of pathogens, not semi-related uh, public health issue of pathogens, is that Borchardt seems to have come up with some different stuff than what we learned when we were out at Normie Lane Farms. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear from him again. The question is, should we wait till he puts it in his report or should we ask him to come back again? Mr. Chairman, can yeah. I make a suggestion? <coughs> what would be wrong with <coughs> proposing a draft to the leadership of the county board, making a recommendation outline of the issues that you want to tackle from this committee and that you're currently working on, and you work and, and, and inform them that you're waiting for the science reports that are coming out soon to fine tune these. You've already got a nice outline there. That sounds there. an awful lot like the check is in the mail. <laughs> you know, that, that really bothers me a lot, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, I, I know that, that's possible. If, if they're pushing for something, you can at least give them what you're working on, Yeah. but don't give them the final details. Well, okay. well let's, that was kind of what I was getting at when I asked Donna, right. you know, can we draft yeah. something yeah. referring to it and then, and then do the final... Um, I, yeah, I can, I can draft something and submit it for you good, for us to work on too. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I say I can do it is, is I'm theoretically retired, <laughs> uh, so I, I have a little more time than most. I know Donna's schedule is very, very busy, um, and I know that uh, uh, I know that uh, Shane is pers uh, missing in action many days, but uh, he's, he's very busy too. Um, so I mean, I, I could I could do that, and, and I know Peter is, is tied up well, with this. You know, Mr. Chairman, I, I would just as soon uh, agree with uh, with Hilly here is to wait. I'm not so much concerned about the leadership. Um, well, part of it. Uh, well, <laughs> part of it. But I think this is a very important issue and it needs to be treated uh, very delicately. And I think we ought to wait until we get that report. And who knows what the report is really going to show. We might be sitting here and having another debate about the same issue. Well, then, I think Shane made a very um, interesting comment about, and he, he's, made, he's made this distinction several times, 
that this report is going to deal with best practices yes. and they're basically dumping that report in the lap of the people like us who will make policy. That's right. But it goes back, Ed, also to what policy can we make if indeed the counties take their marching orders <coughs> from the state? That's why hearing from WCA is so important because I don't even know how far we can go well, with developing policy that's not given to us by the state. I agree, and that's one of the reasons that I, you know I conferred with our uh, paralegal. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Our resident paralegal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I mean I think it's why. critical <laughs> for us to know. What we can do, because it goes back to what Bob is saying, and actually Peter Kastenholz has said this too. Don't you put anything in place that I can't go to court and defend, you know? And so yeah, we, he, well, he's serious about that. Uh, well, I know. absolutely, I, I, I and, and rightfully so. Okay, um, that makes sense. Let, let's deal with um, so. let's deal with the public uh, odor. Anything we can do to control that. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, larger facilities are more apt to install digester systems. Mm -hmm. Digesters have a huge, uh, they help a tremendously on reducing order and also killing a large percentage of the pathogens. Yes. But not every operation can afford a digester. No, they're very You're expensive. probably going to have to be at Typically speaking, you're over 700 cows in order to cash flow one of those things. So you're not typically going to see it on that mid-range farm. And there's no, there is no science that you're aware of that for the smaller farms without a digester can, can mitigate odor. Very little that can be done short of covering facilities. Okay. Um, I've, I've seen that done. You mean like cows. the the, uh, the pit itself? The, the pit big floating mat, yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, it was interesting. Um, we were going to Christ Lutheran to the corral service on uh, Sunday, and we had to go by Weber Farm up there at the top. And I said to my grandchildren, you know, this used to be on the outskirts of town. You know, there used to be a time when Weber Farm was on the outskirts of town because it was pretty odiferous when we went by. And I said, and now they're right here, you know. And so they do have a covered pit, which is very helpful. But there are some days when I just think, what well, was those kids at Washington School smell? Because that used to be out of town. And now people want to live out of town, and all of a sudden they smell the smells of the country and aren't is Yeah, the covered pit is the... Uh, so I, I guess as far as owner pit is concerned, we can just recommend best practices of covered pit. Well, but you remember what... Um, um, the guy who the tour that we went to, he said, I have neighbors. <laughs> and he said, I want to be a good neighbor. And that was one thing that um, he said about controlling odor, is that he knew that his neighbors were not going to be real happy. And of course, he's got a digester because he's big yeah. enough. But I think that the, a lot of these farmers do care about their neighbors and want to decrease <coughs> the odor. Okay, is there anything else you need to say about this? Bill. The other thing is the time factor. Um, the sooner you can get the manure <coughs> into the ground, chisel it in, whatever, the less odor you're going to have. So time yeah, really, great. really for the most part, odor doesn't exist until you stir, agitate, and pump them. Nine times out of ten, you can walk behind a facility with a 15 million gallon manure storage facility, and you probably didn't even know it was there until they stir and agitate and pump it. And that's a good point, Bill, for the most part. The quicker you can get that on the ground, the quicker you can get that incorporated into the soils, the quicker that odor goes away. And if you can minimize that, and a lot of your bigger farmers will work with their neighbors because they know them, they'll inform them, hey, we're gonna be empty in the pit, we're gonna be hauling or spraying on such and such a days, yeah, it goes a long ways. Okay, so the three so the three factors in controlling order are either digesters, time, or cover. Okay. Is that right?
Now, are there are there DNR rules about having a digester, or is it all business? It's all related to cash flow. All related to business and cash flow. Yeah, no there's no, there, I don't know any DNR regulation that requires you to have no. a digester. Then that'll fall back on local ordinances to when they design those facilities that they need. Our Okay, so we got something about the 500-foot rule in the minutes. That's the current. Yeah, that's the current standard. Yeah, that's the current. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're on to. Unless anybody, anybody else needs anything on this, or we're okay. So we're on to the public health aspect, and this one is interesting. It's interesting because, let's get up here, let's get this up here first. <coughs> it, okay, there, we're, we know the biggest concern we've had about the thing is the pathogens. That's always been the biggest thing. And that, since we started on this committee, that information about the pathogens has changed significantly. It really has. Uh, the other thing, and this is interesting, and I think it's in chapter 254.33, I've got it written down somewhere, and I hope my memory isn't failing me, um, 254.33 of the state statutes, it gives the county the ability, the county health department, the ability to go in and deal with any public health hazard, which is this wide, okay? The question is, does that apply to ag? And, and what are, aside from the pathogens, what are the public health hazards? And Donna, what, you got any ideas on that? Well, you know, I, I, this is the first time I've seen this article, yeah. so I don't get this, but, you know, I thought this was a very interesting um, comment. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because here the bathwater looks pretty good. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I think that we should be um, encouraged that, you know, these pathogens didn't make the researchers sick, and it didn't, uh, it appeared that the that 500, 700 foot thing kept, there was pretty low risk with disease producing pathogens from manure. That's, that's what I was talking about because mm -hmm. I think the first thing I ever heard about the pathogens was from Christy Greening's presentation here where there were 160 of them in manure. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing I heard. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like, well, yeah, there could be. There could be up to 160 different ones, but only four of them Four of them are really the the, uh, the bad ones that affect human beings. And it could be any combination of those 160 at any given time, you know. Right. And there are pathogens <laughs> all over the place. I mean, you know, you I'm go to the grocery it. store yeah. and, and, you know, we've got CA MRSA now, Community Acquired MRSA. I mean, What's that? Oh, it's a, it's a, a resistant strain of staff in the community yeah. and I'm it's, uh, it's the super bug you, kind of thing but you know we have hospital acquired MRSA we have community acquired MRSA there are just pathogens all over the place that really can give us really big problems and so I was I'm pleased to see that the risk is low from this study um, you probably have more risk going to the grocery store and pushing the cart, you know, around. So I, I'm pleased to see this. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. And I think, you know, talking about public health and pathogens now, I think the biggest word that you need to write on that board is the word risk. Because as policymakers, what if Mark Borkart says there's a one in a thousand, a thousand chance of one of these pathogens making the child sick? Well, then I look at the 4,000 people I represent, and I say that means four of, of my people in Saratoga get sick. That's <coughs> unacceptable to me. That's going to be the crux of our problem. It, it's risk. It's how do, you, how do you determine the risk and then what you can do about it. Well, you know, you know uh, statistically, one in a thousand is 
pretty damn small. It Unless is one you're in, that it's, one. It's, it's well, well and except I have a that it does a story about that. <laughs> that? I'm sorry. I said I have a wonderful story about that. My husband, as a cardiac surgeon, died of HIV infection. There's less than a half a percent of healthcare workers that get HIV infection from. So for me, that was a hundred, but the risk is low. You know, I, what do you, I mean, we take risks every day, and we have to decide what is. You know, when we put up a stoplight. Sometimes we don't put up that stoplight until six people have been killed at that intersection. What I is mean, the, what are we willing to pay to reduce everybody's risk? And that's where it becomes a cost benefit kind of thing. And I'm not making light of your, of your thing, but how do we reduce every risk that people have? And what is the cost of reducing that risk? It's a huge ethical issue. Oh, Bob, go ahead. Well, just a reference to that, uh, when they put in Highway 10, well, that's here a couple years ago, yes. I have eight, eight pits now in the town of Miller that they created with the highway, so I got eight mosquito traps now out there. <laughs> Besides, I've much more chance of water going into Junction City there, and I trade whoever was going high because they have this one pit close, close to the well where they blasted in there, and there their water, they had to shut one well on Junction City now because of nitrate, and increasingly coming in faster because of the pit caused by this new road. So. What were we to do? We couldn't. They say no. Yeah. Government domain, we can do what we want anytime we want, and we can't do anything about it. Yeah, but you get to tax it as water for it. But that's the same with, with mosquitoes or anything else you're creating. Oh, no. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that fits under this, but okay. Yeah, but anyway, right, the, the, uh, I, think I, I right, can't put it in the minutes. I, I think the. Um, it's the risk thing. You know, it, it's about the, the question about. How could this guy have dried in the river? The average depth is only a foot deep. Well, that's the average, you know, and that's that's the problem with statistics is that it's 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 the larger the sample, the uh, the uh, the more variation in in the uh, in, in the uh, the actual depth. And I think I know if he said it was one in a thousand, um, I think. All the stuff we talked about here earlier about air quality and water quality would mitigate that risk and bring it down to let, okay, it's one in a thousand if they're in the direct path of the spray, but it might be one in a hundred thousand if we make sure that it doesn't go off the property line, make sure that it doesn't get into the water supply, and make sure that it's not floating in the air. So basically, those risks can be mitigated by some of the things that we've talked about. But can they be completely eliminated? Never. 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 I, I think it's important that we remember that none of us here is an epidemiologist. None of us can understand what the real risks are, and numbers being thrown around are not, are not what uh, really would apply. If we want to find out what the risks are to the population, we have to deal with um, either Mark or or somebody else of that stature who understands, because he understands what the numbers translate to within the population. Yeah, I wonder how that's going to show up in his report. I don't know, but I know that is. he had done previous reports for, uh, that the planning and zoning used to work on the uh, various regulations that we had put in place because he brought in uh, uh, holding tanks and childhood um, hospitalization for gastroenteritis problems. So he knows how to do that. We don't. But we can all agree that we want to make the risk as low That's, as possible. That is, as that is exactly possible. At sea, and then it goes I back think, to I mean, we, we, is, anytime you walk on the ground barefoot, you are at risk for getting uh, right. anthrax. Right. anthrax. That's true. You yes, you are. It's in the soil, you. everywhere. I don't want to go to grocery stores, and I want to walk on the barefoot. <laughs> Well, but it's, it's all the facts, but we how many people a life of risk? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think there, there is a consensus here, that, that one, one, one consensus of, of the group is that whatever, that the county, the county and the state should do whatever is in its power to minimize the risk. That's, that's the key within that's, its power. That's it. If, if the laws and the legislation is not there, 
they either change the laws and legislation or you work within the realm of, of the regulation got. you have. That's what we currently do. Okay, in, the, in this part, Kewanee County's ordinance, I was taking a look at that. Kewanee County's hanging, I think they're hanging their hat on that. On that uh, 254.33.331 3, and 33, 3, I think. I'll have to look at that. Uh, they're hanging their hat on that and saying that they can, they're trying to regulate manure, ir spray irrigation from the public health standpoint. <coughs> and what science are they using to do that? I, I didn't see any science in that in that ordinance. It's so in, it I got the ordinance in my in my. Is it a very emotional ordinance? No, it, it, I, I think it was. I think it was it was based in enough legal. It was based on some legalese that that and I can understand that. If, if if I were an attorney arguing the case, mm -hmm. it would be the statute says I can do this. I have identified this as a public health issue, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to regulate it under that statute. And here's and here's the definition. I would define public health issue mm -hmm. to my favor. Mm -hmm. I would and I would argue that case to my favor. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we, you know, um, do our public health people really want to do that? I mean, do they want to do they? Because this would require probably. Uh, this would probably require a whole new uh, ramp up of the environmental health operation itself. And then Peter Kastenholz would have to be asked, could he defend that ordinance exactly. in the court? Exactly. exactly. And, and that, that would be part of the, part of the difficulty. Well, let me see if I can pull that thing out of here right now. Um, yeah, this is, this is yeah, here's the quantity now. And that's very recent, Mr. Chairman? This is the one, uh, August 12th of 2014. 2014. Um, and it passed the county board? Yeah, I guess it did. Well, certainly, yeah, Kewanee well, County has been a leader. Yeah, they, well, they, they, have a, they have a bigger problem than leader. That was the draft that I did. So anyway, um, I don't know if this is one I think we may need to talk about at a future meeting when we, when we get in when we get into the broad subject of regulation. Once we get the uh, the the opinion back from the Wisconsin Counties Association, um, we may want to talk about the Kewanee County ordinance and see if it has any application to what we want to do or how we're going to do it. Okay, because I don't know what to do about that. So, have I missed something? I, I'm not. I'm not claiming to be the, the the expert on this, obviously, because I'm learning just like a lot of you are. But is there some other issue that we should be taking up other than what we've covered is air, water, and public health, and is there some other, and have we, have we covered all the topics within those? Yes, Bill. I'm thinking that probably the seed committee and many Saratoga residents would want us to at least consider for a short time, look at another topic up there, that being the economic well-being mm -hmm. of the area where the Golden Sands Dairy is proposed to be built. And how does that pertain to the Northern Wood County? And how does that pertain to, I'm sorry? To Northern Wood County? It doesn't. That's the problem. We have to address the whole county. Or to Millidor for that reason. I'm sorry, Bob, I didn't want to leave you out. So, the point, I don't know that, the only thing we've learned, the, the only thing we've learned about the economics of spray waste irrigation is that Manure is gold, as far as farmers are concerned. It, it keeps them from having to buy additional chemicals and things of that nature. It's probably the most efficient way of growing crops, you can fire the, of, of, of enhancing crops that you can get. That's the only economic impact I know of, of from that. I, I'm not, 
And I, I think you're probably talking about property values, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. And I was thinking the same thing, Ed, because when you talk about property values, it's a local issue. It's a township issue, not a county issue. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was saying, well, it's because locating a CAFO in Saratoga doesn't affect the price of land in Auburndale. What if the Auburndale CAFO expands, though, which they're known to do within five years of, of being created? Then it, it becomes a county issue once again. It, no. Now it affects the northern end of the county. It, it really... It, and I, again, our ability to regulate it is about the same as it is in the town of Saratoga, and that is zilch. Zero. You can't, you, until you guys get, get a, zo a zoning ordinance in that, that handles that kind of thing, you have no control at all. Actually, we do have zoning. Well, you do now. You do now. Four years ago, you did. Anyway, uh, I guess we're down to what? Next meeting day? Okay, anybody else before we? Would you then have some kind of, put this all together as a draft that we could chew over? Right. Is that, that? Yeah. Are you, yeah, I, yes, I will put that together. You can put in the minutes and I'll provide a draft before the next meeting. And I don't think it has to be a lengthy, I think Shane's point about just an outline kind of thing. I have already written an outline yeah. and that now is uh, completely out the window, and, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to write but it I up. I think this was a wonderful way to look at it, mm -hmm. um, and I commend well you for that because this was really uh, helped to make it succinct as to what clarified. Yes, yeah, really clarified what our mission was, and then focused our discussion on the key points of that. Well, I, I thought the biggest fear I had was we were losing focus, and and I, I was hoping we could bring it back. I don't know if we did, but, but it's I think I think I can write an outline of this and and, and get it done uh, for us. And, and so, when do you want to meet again? Are we going to let the typical month go by? Uh, would that be dragging our feet enough to get the report out? Uh, maybe the report will be out in April. That would be <laughs> that nice. Would, it would be nice if it would. It would be nice if it would. He hasn't said much at all. I know, I know. I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look at the week of March, I mean of April the 13th. I will be out of state. Oh, you will not be in yes. there. Can we go April 13th? Yeah, I yes. said April. I'd prefer we go another week beyond that. Yeah, and Hildy, that's not a good week for her either. I will be out of state. What about Thursday the 23rd? Thursday, Thursday the 23rd no, is the only open day. Yeah, because I don't calendar. teach on Thursdays now. I teach on Fridays. The 23rd is good for me. Peter? Why not? <laughs> I'm here. Bob? Well, the day of April Fool's Day, that's all right. Okay. We have seat meeting on April Fool's Day. That's bad enough. At least the elections aren't on April Fool's Day this and year. And you know what? I just looked at my calendar. I actually have a meeting from 11 to 12.30 on campus. You want to be at 1.30? Yeah, I could get down here by 1.30. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's April 23rd. April 23rd. Yeah. Okay. It's a Thursday. 1.30, and let's make sure we keep the time the same because my minutes from last time said that we were supposed to start this one at 9.30. I saw that and then I got the agenda that said <laughs> yeah. the clock. These, these meeting times have kind of been fluid and it's kind of hard to plan. Well, and, and the fluidity is not bad as long as we all know what it is. <laughs> Everybody's, it's a test. Are you it's a attention? test to make sure how you're paying attention. Right. So, so one at 1.30? 1.30, April 23rd. Okay, got it. Okay. We're all there. Before we close, did uh, the attendance sheet... Where did the attendance sheet go? Where did go? it end up? Yeah, make sure everybody signs Is it, that. Is it back in the other room? No, I saw somebody carry it. Well, it I'll look for somewhere. it. It's it's, Dennis was in charge. He must have messed it up. Ha, ha, ha.